resume the recording here. Uh, Michael, thank you for being here. This is great to see you. And even though we're kind of on different parts of the state right now, I really appreciate you uh, being here. Um, and folks, feel free to ask questions as you go along. There's a chat function at the bottom. I will monitor that and I will pass along questions to Michael as we go along. So um, Michael, cheers. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. It's got a cheers with a bottle of wine. And um, so I wanted to start out in a little different uh, vein in some ways and that I've recently had the opportunity to read and then also listen to your book. So you are an author also, in addition to being a winemaker and a chops player on the piano. Yeah, yeah, I got a book out. I got some help with it from a really good guy. Tucker Max is the guy's name and took me four years to get through it. And uh, but yeah, I got through it. And it's mainly the book. Uh, it's a bunch of stories. Starts out when I was a kid, kind of what led me into wine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my early days in Wenatchee, Washington, Apple capital of the world, hometown salute. And uh, I was in the circus there. So a bit of that. That's why it's called Cirque, one of my brands. And then all my restaurant work and then moving to Sonoma County and falling in love with, with wine. And then the trials and tribulations of learning a craft that I didn't know about. And um, it kind of gets into a lot of those different things and a little so kind of some do's and don'ts from my point of view, my perspective of people that want to get in the business, which I encourage, but discouraged at the same time. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I think you were smart how you, you, you that in some ways. Um, one of the questions uh, on that, you were like early on in the book talking about how you grew up, family. I mean, it's all cool, but um, and first off, let me tell you, I like to write a lot. And so I've often thought about writing stories down, that kind of thing. It's amazing you did it, but you revealed a lot too. Family history, some great things, some things that weren't so great, all that kind of thing. Was that opening that chapter up? Is that a, was that a hard thing or easy or? It was, it was a hard thing. Um, I had to be vulnerable and honest. Yeah. Um, because that was what kind of led me to where I was. And the guy helped me write. He goes, Michael, it's a good story. You should put this in. And I, I tapered it down. And, um, you know, I had, I didn't grow up in an abusive family. I just had some, you know, there were some issues there. Yeah, I mean, there were, I didn't know how to navigate. Yeah, there were so, some that weren't like great. They weren't horrible, but it was like a, a challenge. And I could see how opening up about that may not have been that easy. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't that easy. But I finally said, you know what, it is part of what, where I came from. And, I'll, I'll let it out there, you know, and it, it, nothing is severe, as you know, Adam, as you read it and listened to it. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, again, it, the reason I put that in there was because it, it was part of my upbringing and part of what got me to where I am today. Uh, well, I, I thought it was fascinating and uh, it was interesting to read the book because I've got it, uh, that and then um, and then to listen to it. and. You have quite the, uh, the I don't know if you call him a narrator or the person that was, uh, uh, that reads the book to us. That's, it's pretty fantastic, so. Yeah, um, yeah, so what happened there was uh, the book company said, hey, um, uh, we're gonna do hardback, paperback, Kindle, and audiobook." And I go, okay, and they go, we have seven narrators. Um, can you grab me a book, Sylvie? Um, down in LA and we'll send you all their stuff and you pick whatever makes sense to you. And I went home that night and I go, well, I don't know where to meet these people. And there's two people I'd want to read this or narrate this book, Mo either Morgan Freeman or William Shatner, right? <laughs> you got to go for it, man. Sure. And William Shatner, or Morgan Freeman would have been really hard for me to get at, but a buddy of mine owns a CRN radio down in LA, Mike Horn. Yeah. And uh, he knows William Shatner. I said, do you think Mr. Shatner would want to narrate this. He goes, I don't know, send me the manuscript. And a week later, I'm on the phone with Captain Kirk. And he says, Michael, I like the manuscript, but it's got a certain tone to it. I need to lower my tone. And after our conversation, he goes, I have more of your tone. I'm going to try to match your tone to your book. And I think he did a really good job. So it's a kick. And what a sweetheart of a guy. He's 90 now. I don't know if you know that, but he's 90 years old. No. And, mm -hmm. um, and I thought he did a really fantastic job. And I was sitting there one, one night with my wife on the couch and we have a busy household with the kids and everything. And uh, 
I said, hey, listen to this one. A chapter came out and she was distracted by what was the dog and the kids. And then she looks at me kind of weird. I go, what? And she goes, how does he sound like you? <laughs> I go, well, he used to run the Starship Enterprise. He knows a few tricks, right? So I, that's what it looks like. It's on Amazon, titles Pinot Rocks. I'm not trying to sell a million books. It's just part of our part of my story. And that's, that's as far as it goes, you know? Well, one of the things I really loved were the early chapters talking about history, the way you got into wine, and how well, you and I share in common the fact that really neither one of us truly studied this. I mean, we, we studied it in our own ways, but not through college classes, that kind of thing. Very true, yeah. And I remember Adam and John Ash, I used to bartend there, and used to come in and... Uh, I'd watch you do your thing. And I go, man, I want to do that. I looked up to you and what you were doing. And I go, I want to do that. And the, the old William Selliams, Bert and Ed, what they were doing. I'm like, wow, and Gary Farrell and Davis Bynum and Tom Dellinger, all these guys. I love those wines. And, but I'm a terrible student, a book student. I love to read books, but I'm not a good, I'm not good at school. You know, I get distracted. And so I'm a hard knock university guy. And I, at one point I finally decided that I want to be a craftsman. I want to, make wine. I love agriculture. And I thought, well, I'll just volunteer at a winery, which happened to be Deerfield Ranch Winery in Kenwood. And I knew Robert Rex a little bit. And he said, yeah, come on down. I can't pay you, but I'll teach you what I know. I go, I'm in. So I'd work that during the day, work restaurants at night. And then we started Costa Brown at the same time. That was 1997. And then just going through um, practicing and, and figure out what works, what doesn't work, do more of what works and less of what doesn't work if I'm lucky, like we all have as winemakers. And then uh, develop my own style. Just some was intentional, some it just kind of went that direction. You and know? One of the things you're very open about in the book is some of it was screw ups along the way where you said, oh no, I'm not gonna do this again. I mean, that that, that happens too at some point in time. It does, it does, yeah. I made big batches of vinegar in the past, you know, yeah, not intentionally, but um, you learn from it. Hopefully, you yeah. know, people and all the questions. all the different aspects, Adam, as you know, um, from how you clean things to how you farm to how you pick your grapes to canopy management um, to fermentation styles to different fermentation vessels and aging vessels. They all have a key, and and what I. See Today, Adam, is because um, I, I love music and I use music and color as an analogy to wine. That's how I see it, through sounds and color on my palate. But music, um, there's a certain tone. And I say, once the grapes have been picked, the song has been written. And then we, can, we have the opportunity to add instruments to that song while maintaining the balance of what Mother Nature gave us. And that's how I look at the different fermentation styles, the different barrels, the different aging, and um, and how we produce the wine, you know. And I just and there's an interesting story. I think you've heard this one from me. I was watching a number of years ago. I was watching a uh, documentary on Fleetwood Mac, Rumors. Yeah. And I forget the song, but they were like, we couldn't figure out what was missing out of this song. And they go, well, finally, we figured it out. And they've got a pretty dynamic band, as we all know. And uh, they go, it was a tambourine in the background. And they added the tambourine and brought the whole song together. Very minute detail. And that's what we go for, those minute details. And I like to maintain balance in Pinot Noirs. We do make intense wines, but they're also elegant. I like in, in, in intense elegance. That's what I like, you know? Yeah. And one of the things... So, I mean, there's a lot in, in the book and a lot in your history. And you mentioned about not necessarily being a great book student, but then, uh, you know, you became a craftsman and you talked to people at Deerfield and, and all of that and these people that came along. I often wonder a little bit, one of the things in your story that I thought was fascinating is you did mention one class, maybe it was in high school, that it was Shakespeare that you were... Yeah really into and it was almost because the teacher was so good that's exactly why yeah and um a lot of the teachers they would just read out of a textbook and they were boring and i didn't learn a lot i'd fall asleep to be honest with you because so i was working restaurants at night in high school you know yeah. but the shakespeare teacher he was great um he would go to rock concerts and we'd go to his class he'd put the chairs in a circle 
and we discussed Shakespeare, you know, Macbeth, Hamlet, you name it. And um, it was very engaging and I liked that. And I learned a lot and I, I really enjoyed that, uh, that class. So, you know, I just took it because I thought it'd be easy, but I actually wound up learning something, not only about Shakespeare, but about how my mind kind of works and how I like to learn. Yeah, and but I, I fascinating because you mentioned then, like it later in the book, uh, Bert and Ed, and then you just mentioned earlier, Gary Farrell, I remember was a big deal back when we were going and you'd get an Allen Vineyard Pino, if you could possibly, it was difficult to get. Um, Tom Dellinger, things like that. And while they weren't sitting us down in a circle, you could sometimes go to these people and talk to them if you really wanted to, but you could also learn from their efforts, from yes. popping those bottles and saying, oh my God, this is fantastic. How, how did this happen kind of thing? Oh, I mean, my epiphany wine was a 91 Allen Vineyard Pinot from William Sellian. and I had it in 95, I think 96. And I was into bigger wines, Zinfandel's, Cabernet's, things like that. Pinot Noir, I had a few that I liked, but then uh, Margie Williams' birth daughter, first daughter came to this potluck we had with the restaurant people on the, uh, the uh, Dry Creek barrel tasting, Rush River barrel tasting. And she brought some samples she had from a tour earlier that day and she poured this wine. I go, that's good. Then she poured that Allen Vineyard. It blew my head off. The intensity of the aromatics, the intensity of the flavors, the balance that that wine had blew me away. And I go, I wanna do that. That's what I want to do. I dig the style. I just, it, it's a, it's like dancing with my wife. You know, it's a beautiful thing. And, and cause it's a dance, right? Winemaking to me is a dance. And man, I go, that is a good partner to have. And um, there's definitely other varietals to make, but um, I'm just in love with Pinot Noir primarily. Were you encouraged or discouraged by I mean, people would always talk about how difficult it was, particularly back in, in those days where very few of us were doing that kind of thing. Was that discouraging to you or did that provide like a challenge that you were into? What Provided a challenge. So I like things that are hard to do. Um, I like when people say I can't do something. Well, I'm going to give it my best shot to do it. And I've got numerous examples of that kind of thing working. And then they said, Pinot is the hardest thing. Why start there? I go, well, if it's the hardest thing, I'm going to start there. Why not? Dive in full body cannonball into the pond, right? Sure. And um, which is always a fun thing to do. But um, and, uh, and what, I, what I found out, and I had certain people teaching me how to make wine and they would go, you need to do it this way, this way, this way, this way. And then because of a happenstance or circumstances, I would do it a different way, not because I was planning on it, because I didn't have time or whatever. And I developed my own style that way. And what I found out through that development of my process mentally and sensory, right? Sensory is a, is a good thing to talk about, but um, is that making Pinot Noir different technique than say some other red varietals, but not too different. Farming. Pinot Noir is extremely difficult, unlike other red varietals. Very, very temperamental, very difficult. So if we can get that fruit to a point of ripeness, that you have those fresh fruit flavors, like a fresh raspberry, a fresh cherry, a fresh, fresh rhubarb, cranberries, that freshness, that peak of ripeness, not overripe stewed, not underripe green. I want it right when it's ripe. Can you make a blackberry pie, for example? And you get the right blackberry grown in the right area by the right person. And you pick just the berries that are perfect that day. Make a pie out of that, man. Little hogging dogs of vanilla on the side. That's good. And it's, it's the same thing with wine grapes, in my opinion. It's fruit. And all wine is is fermented grape juice. But if we get the best fruit we can, and I, I believe um, the West Coast of the of, uh, United States is where some of the best in the world grows. I'm partial to Russian River because we live here and I love the style, you know, um, but there's also other other areas where we're, we're making wine from, which I really enjoy as well, because uh, Pinot Noir is very transparent in its place, not only in its, its, its specific vineyard, but also in its region. Mm -hmm. You can see it. And it's a neat thing. We made an Oregon Pinot for my new branch, Chev in 20 and it's a completely different animal and a really cool wine, but totally different beast, you know? 
So you've made Pinot now from a lot of different areas. I mean, Oregon is new in, in 2020, but San Lucia, Santa Rita, I mean, you've been up and down the coast a, a good bit, Sonoma Coast, Russian River. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I would love to hear your just snapshots on each of the different areas, but also um, one of the things you've done, something I, I've done, is finding really good growers and, and how key yeah. that is and finding those people and having them be, I don't know, part of a team. I mean, they may actually be the leader of the team. We might be more of the follower and they're the leader in some ways with Pino. It depends. Yeah. It depends on the grower. Yeah. And um, first of all, I like to get along with people. I've got the no a-hole rule, right? Mm -hmm. And a few farmers are are that way they could be honoring but that's okay but um i like to have good relationships long-standing relationships very important in many ways in in any industry especially the wine business and then uh and then some vineyards we have to work with pretty intently throughout the year they maybe don't have the resources or the knowledge so we go in there gently and say hey let's do it this way how can we help you other growers just get it done perfectly every year. You check the vineyard. Yep, looks good again. Thanks. Let's go have lunch, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and we have some of each and anywhere in between. And so the grower relationships, their um, ability to farm, their ability to understand Pinot Noir farming or grape farming, very important. It's different than other types of farming. Uh, every every type of farming is different, I suppose, but um that they have an understanding of it and that it's going to wine it's just not i sell my grapes and they're gone no it's going to something really cool hopefully you know and uh not everybody gets that but that's okay too um it's just a matter of having the the right farmers doing the doing the job and, and being in love with it i have always found that the further away the grower is or the vineyard is the more you need to have the grower really be spot on. That if they're right in the backyard, you can go check and make sure they actually did the thinning they said they were going to do, that kind of thing. But, you know, when they're in, I'm in Santa Rita Hills right now, you know, you, uh, and I won't be back again for another 10 days, you're going to ask them to drop some for fruit. You need to believe they're going to do it kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And a good example for me are the Francionis and the Pizzonis. You know, yeah. I go down there and they just have a dialed Mark Pizzoni, just man, does he know stuff, Gary and both Gary's, they know their stuff and they, they get it done right. And, and um, it's really cool, a cool thing to watch because I'm not going to tell them anything they don't know. We can discuss things and as, hey, we tried this or tried that. And yeah, I tried this or tried that. Um, but it, the, 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 the bottom line is they, they're in love with their land so much. They understand wine. They both have both families have wineries, so they get that aspect, and they bring that to the vineyards, and the or the vineyards bring that to them. Either way, uh, and I love about them is that their families, their their parents, even grandparents had that land, and now their kids are having hmm, the land. Yeah, and they're not going to do anything to mess things up. I mean, that's the furthest thing from their mind. They they want this to be there for their great great grandkids, kind of thing. I mean, that's, yeah. That's yeah, a, and it's a, it's noble. It's very a cool thing, and yeah. that's how I feel as well. Whether my kids get into it or not, you know, I would like them to because I think it's really cool. But it's really up to them. But but you have to have something that you can pass along, and um, and have deep roots. You know, deep roots, literally and figuratively, in the ground is so cool and so important. And to have the uh, opportunity to work with mother nature is humbling It's humbling and i'm so grateful for that because she's in control and everything down to the flora and fauna the bees the birds everything you know um it's amazing what she does and we're at her whims she could deliver us beautiful grapes on a golden platter or you know sorry this year's not going to work out <laughs> So that, that ties into a question somebody just asked about the different places that you get fruit from, that type of thing. Um, do you see the drought affecting different regions differently? The weather over the last 
few years? What, where are you um, looking at things and seeing things more challenged or even better right off? Well, I, I don't necessarily look at it as a macro view like global warming, although I'm not a, I'm not a disbeliever in that. Um, but Earth is so powerful, it takes a lot to change that. But it is changing for whatever reason. Um, but I've seen, you know, specifically not, you know, the fires are one thing that doesn't really have to do with the drought. Well, it does. But, um, you know, this year, the drought year, um, if, if vineyards didn't have irrigation, they're probably going to suffer pretty hard. Um, some vineyards we have haven't been watered for 12 years. And this year they needed a little drink early because we didn't get the rain. And uh, so that was a difference, but you got to keep them healthy from the start throughout uh, maturation and harvest. And we don't ever dump water on these vines. You just dose them if they need it, if they need it. There's different ways of telling if they need it or not. And um, if they're well hydrated at a, at a good level. Um, and uh, that's what we look for. And then I, we watch the skies and, and the wind and what's really happening out there. And, you know, because anything can happen, as you know, um, Adam, over the next, uh, you know, four to six weeks, it could be hot as heck and things can dry up soon. It could rain and we can have some detritus. It could be perfect weather. Who knows, right? But we set up for everything because we don't know. That's the mother nature aspect of it. And then you look at the macro mother nature aspect of the whole planet. So that's a bit more of a complex thing going on there. You know, it's funny because we are kind of in the home stretch right now of the 21 vintage, but it's funny how quickly things could go awry. I mean, knock on wood seriously here that it doesn't, but um, it doesn't take a lot at the end here to have things go from, boy, it's looking fantastic to, boy, it's a challenging year now. I believe it was, was it 10 or 13? We had that massive heat wave. I think it was 10. Yeah. Mm, 10. yeah and everybody stripped the leaves because it was a cold summer and everybody's worried about mold and rot. And then all of a sudden it was 113 degrees. And then they didn't strip leaves in 11 because they didn't want that. And then it was a cold, wet year and, and you got screwed in a different way, kind of. Yeah, yeah. So I learned from that 11 a lot too, um, both vintages actually. But 11, um, I go, I've pushed grapes through, through the rain. It's not a big deal. Well, I did that on a couple of vineyards later and it just kind of melted off the vine. And I go, oh, learn something. Yeah. We picked some yeah. from the same vineyard earlier earlier than what I've liked and it was much better than the stuff we hung because it basically just melted so you learn stuff every year if you, if you keep your eyes and ears open and and to some extent <laughs> the best guess along the way too I mean it because yeah. you're not really certain what the last week of harvest is going to bring I played golf not too long ago and I was leading the whole round and I shot a 12 on the 18th hole and I yeah. lost, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, that last week, that last hole, that last whatever can change things pretty drama dramatically. For so. sure, for sure. Um, so one of the, a couple of the questions have been, somebody mentioned of the late harvest wine you made a long time ago at KB. Uh, it was asked about doing Sauvignon Blanc and like y'all starting out kind of with SV in some ways. Um, I know that Pinot holds a special place in your heart and in my heart. And I mean, it's truly, I guess, the wines that we are most wedded to that we're going to be around with forever. But you and I both have played with different things. Talk about yeah. some of the other, other things that you've made and maybe how KB kind of started Sauvignon Blanc wise in some ways or. or yeah, well, in KB, we started with Sauvignon Blanc because it was cheap to make, quick turnaround, no barrels needed stainless steel, because we were bootstrapping the whole thing. And uh, we, we found out that, well, our competition, we were charging 13 bucks a bottle for it or something. You can get a better wine at seven at that point. And I go, this ain't gonna work out. And then I said, let's go for Pinot, because we wanted to do that. And we reformulated our business model to accommodate that, which was a difficult thing to do, but we did. And then we started making Chardonnay at Costa Brown, just as a different, you know, in case somebody likes Chardonnay better than Pinot. And, you know, I'm not trying to make Burgundian wines here. We're in California, like for Pinot Noir. I want to make what's best here in California. But man, 
my favorite wine region for Chardonnay is Montrachet. And I love those wines. I had a DRC Montrachet one night, blew my head off. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. So with a Chardonnay, we have some really great vineyards, all Russian River, mainly west of here, not on the coast proper, but um, in, the, in a good bandwidth. And um, that's an interesting topic too, the proper coast versus inland a little bit. But we uh, pick different times based on the vineyard. We use um, very mild new barrels and neutral barrels, stainless steel barrels and forests um, and eggs, which we ferment in an agent to keep that purity. And what I like about um, Chardonnay, the, it can't happen and I like our chef, I'm not trying to pimp it out, but I like it because it, it, it did what we were trying to do. And that is bring out like fresh orange blossom and maybe fresh apricot and a really light, refreshing um, lemon tart, for example, the very light pastry, you know, things like that. And I don't like diacetyl. I don't like the buttery thick ones, you know, I like fresh and clean vibrancy, not rip your teeth out acidic wise, but a nice balance of acidity and mouthfeel. And that's where tone comes in to me on, um, on wines and in relation to like music, you know, if the tones are right and in balance, and you, then you can accentuate those really fresh, beautiful flowers and fruits. Um, I think then you have something. And so the Chardonnay has turned into something where it takes a bit more study, easier to grow. But man, it can be finicky in the cellar, as you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's okay. I don't mind a long malolactic fermentation with Chardonnay. Let it let it ride. It gets more complex, in my opinion. But um, yeah, it's a fun thing. And then that somebody mentioned the late harvest Chardonnay, the snake oil. Yeah. Well, Cirque, you know, it's like a circus. And I was in a circus when I was a kid. That, those are fun stories there. But um, I envisioned um, somebody back on the East Coast that had a snake oil business. It would try to keep up with the circus train, you know. Yeah. And he would try to, he would nail a box together. He would take whatever he had as a foil and, you know, and call it snake oil. Well, that's what we did. And the, the capsule on that bottle is made of old newspaper, you know, and it's got a little twine around it with a fishing weight to hold it on and stuff like that. But that was an interesting one because I made some late harvest of EMA for a winery called Gemrose a number of years ago. And I liked the process. And Jeremiah, who works with me now here, worked with me at Costa Brown. Um, we did that uh, snake oil together. And it was a difficult thing. I foot stomped that to death. I had to foot stop it. It's slippery, nasty. And then uh, we made that wine and it was a big, big challenge, big, big challenge to make that wine. But it was a very fun process and I was really happy the way it turned out. And so that was, that just came about. That was Bootlegger's Hill Chardonnay. And we had like an acre left and it's like, well, we could sell it for four grand a ton because we leased the vineyard at the time. And I said, let's cut the canes, keep the acidity, let it mold and we'll make a late harvest. And so when those types of things come up, they just pop out of the blue. It's like, that would be fun. You can't plan it. It's just going to happen, right? And I love, I love the things. I think those are fantastic. Um, it's weird, though, because I keep coming back to Pinot. You know, what yeah. I, the, the, that is, uh, yeah, this opportunity. Last year, I made a Grenache Mauvet because I lost so much of my Pinot, but I had a chance to get that. So it's like, yeah, let me play with that. But really, Pinot, I think, is where both of our hearts mm, yeah. lie. And I just, I just love Pinots in general. And um, it is a challenge. It takes a bit more study, in my opinion. And, it, and it, it can be finicky in the cellar. It can need some time alone. Or it could need a little bit of attention now and again. You have to be aware of what it needs or what it might be asking for. And that could be nothing, you know. And so we don't like to overwork our wines in any ways, but if we sense something or if we see something, okay, well, this needs a little extra attention. Let's go ahead and do this. But we have to study it in detail to make sure we make the right decisions in the winemaking process. So not to ruin the wine or not to lose nuance or balance or, or delicacy within that wine, because you can lose it pretty darn quick in many different ways. You mentioned one of the things in the book, this gets pretty geeky, but I think our audience would be cool into it, about not racking Pinot. Have you stuck with that pretty much all the time or do you? Well, when I, yeah, when I started, everybody told me you 
got a rack your wines at least twice and all this stuff. But it was interesting what I learned. Uh, Pinot Noir has a different molecular con um, configuration than most red varietals. And Greg LaFollette taught me this. And, and if you rack your wines, you're going to hit them with air no matter how careful you are. So you have to add more sulfur, which kind of rips the soul out of the wine, in my opinion. And so, but I, I didn't have plans not to, or to stop racking, but one year, I think it was 03, I was so busy, I didn't have time to rack our wines. I just didn't have time. Yeah. Like, oh my God, I, I blew it. And then I realized, wait a minute, I've got all these different components here, all these different instruments, these different colors, and I can fine tune a blend based on what I have. And since that point, we keep every lot separate. We don't rack our wines um, ever, except for a bottling. And then uh, we just, we let them be, you know? And, and that's how that came about. And I'm glad it came about because I like, I like how it's done. And everybody has a different way of doing it. Some winemakers, they'll take everything from one vineyard, blend it all together and blend it again. And, and they're fine wines, they're good wines. Um, but that's the cool thing about making wine is we all have our own way of doing it. How are we learned? Yeah. And I think there is something about learning in the process along the way, being open to new ideas or new, uh, like you discovered something in that year where you didn't have time. And if, if you had had time to continue to do what you've been doing, who knows how long it would have been before you discovered that you prefer your wines without being racked. I mean, it, 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 yeah. it's, it's fascinating how these things come about in some ways. It is, yeah. It is. And you have to fall on your face every once in a while. You know, you have to wreck yeah. um, to yeah. wake you up or to go, hmm, I, I should have been paying more attention. And, so, you know, that brings me to some of my circus stories where, you know, when the high wire came down mid show or I blew my face off breathing fire. Well, you learn pretty quick not to do that again. Well, one of the circus stories I loved in your book that you were talking about was how I think it was like a bike on the high wire, but you had practiced like barely off the ground at all. You, you were on the, the rope, so you had the balance down, you knew how to balance on it, but then bef like two hours before the show, when you had to be up there, it was the first time you were actually on, uh, like way up in the air. And then you were like, oh crap, <laughs> you know, this is- It's a different thing yeah. when you're 25 feet up in the air, cause you don't see the wire or nothing. I mean, you can see it, but it's like, good Lord. And I sat there for 15 minutes and they go, Michael, you got this, but you got to write it across as practice before the show. And I finally said, you know what? I'll go for it. And I'll, if I fall, I'll throw the pole this way, bouncing pole, I'll throw the bike this way and I'll try to land between them in the net, you know? Uh, but it worked out, it worked out. Other, well, other times, it was so fortunate. But it reminds me a little bit of like, when you're making some home wine or when you and I are playing around with a, a late harvest Chardonnay, like you made, whatever, if it didn't work out, it's not like, okay, the late harvest Chardonnay didn't work this year. I mean, that was an extra thing. It wasn't like you're in front of the audience in front of anything. One of the things you talked about in the book that I thought was amazing was the, like when you had success, like you got some great, ratings, some great reviews on some of the, the KB wines early on, it actually made it a little more pressure the next year. Yeah. To, to the, the success had its own challenges here. Very much so. Yeah, it was very uncomfortable for a while because I, I didn't want to be a flash in the pan. And I, at that point, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was just doing the best I could. And some of those earlier wines were high in alcohol and bigger than what I wanted. It wasn't by design. It was just, I picked the grapes too late because I couldn't get pickers, you know? Sure. That's how that came about, but but that started a style, and then we refined that style. Uh, so explain to people what you got going now. I mean, a lot of people know you from KB, but you've got two fascinating things going. Help, explain to people the difference. You've got Cirque and Chev, and I mean, show them the bottle, please, if you don't mind, but how, uh, or the bottles, but how they differ That's one true. from the other. What's the different? Well, first of all, that, that's Cirque, yep. and every year the back label changes every wine either a circus ticket or a playbill, or there's always hidden messages like Easter eggs. And so, it, it, you know, the label, this comes from an old newspaper out of San Francisco Chronicle, late 1800s. And this writing came from a, uh, a business registry book from Sonoma County, early 1900s. And, um, and I'll get into Chev in a minute, but uh, that wine is really paying homage to performing arts or 
some high-end product back at turn of the century, 1905, for example, out of San Francisco, that um, it's hard to get and it's luxury product and people want it, and it, but it's hard to find sort of thing. And then it's our job to make a, a, a fine wine out of it. And I like the clean lines, intense, but clean lines, very precise is what we're going for with Cert. And all of our wines need time. They're, they're, they're built to age a bit. And then Chev, um, this is a fun label here. It's based after a car theme, like old car oh. shop. This comes from an old Chevy tailgate, old steam engine logo, which says Chev, we changed it. Battery sticker, that's uh, the month and year bottling. It's got a VIN number on it. Um, on the back, it's got a gas station sign. So just fun stuff to play around with. But it's a little different style. It's a little bit, a, I would say a little bit more voluptuous in character, a little bit more broad and a different price point as well. We make them the same, the cost is the same. It just hits a different market. And um, they're not big over the top wines, but they do have a little more breadth to them. So are they all from, can they both be from different regions? Are they both vineyard designated or not? Or how does that Cirque, we went down to Cirque, we went down to one wine from Russian River Valley. So Cirque is only now one skew, one wine. For Chev, I'm playing around with regions. And so that's the main difference. So we got the Oregon I mentioned. Uh -huh. um, we have Russian River. We have, and somebody said they were drinking it earlier. I think it was Tony or somebody. But anyway, um, and then Santa Lucia we're getting back into, which I love those vineyards. That, different that, flair. That's what Tony's drinking, but go ahead. Keep. Yeah, a different flair from, from Santa Lucia Highlands. And Santa Rita Hills has its own thing going on there too. And so it's regional in approach, regional in approach. And uh, the Chardonnay is right now just from Russian River, and I don't plan on changing that, but who knows, right? You got, got to have an open mind. Um, but on both wines, both brands, I really want to accentuate what Mother Nature gives and what that vintage or that growing season had to offer. I'm not trying to cover that up, make the same wine every year. I want Mother Nature to show. I want people to see Mother Nature through the lens of Pinot Noir. It's such a cool, fascinating thing. W whether you're just enjoying a glass of wine, talking with friends, or whether it's like, wow, I'm going to get into this wine. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't I, I think however you want to enjoy a wine. And our brand's both of them, I just, I have this vision that I really want people to, you know, sit around a fire with their friends and the family, have a little food, some music in the background, a little wine. Wine's not the main focus. It's just part of an evening or an afternoon or whatever. Breakfast, depending on who, you're, who you are. <laughs> but um, but uh, that sort of sense, and I think these days people are craving that just because not only COVID, but just all the social media and everything. It's so nice to get back to our primal instincts of being around people. And again, the fire and the food and nourishment and music. Music goes back thousands and thousands of years, as does wine, obviously food and fermented products, you know, and, and um, it's just a really neat thing, you know, and to, to drive it home in that way, I, I, I think is a, is, a, is a neat, neat thing. And it leads to conversation. Wine slows people down. Then it leads to conversation. And hopefully it's a good one, you know? Yeah. Well, you talked about that in your book and you talked about just the, the people sitting around. And I've always thought, you know, I could drink a, a great bottle of wine that you made. And I could sit here in my Marriott hotel room and it's the same bottle of wine I could have out later. I'm going out with Adam and Nick Francioni tonight. So it's okay. not all bad. But how much more fun it would be to have that bottle with the three of us than it would be sitting in the hotel room. The wine's exactly the same. I mean, it, that does not change, but it's th the way that wine uh, works together with the conversation, with the food, with, with everything. Um, yeah. You talk about that a lot in the book and I think that's so true. I think so too. And, and it doesn't have to be all about the wine. It can, you know, if people want to have a conversation about wine. I think that's great. I love doing that. I just, I'm fascinated by it. But it could just be a, a nice tasty beverage to just add something, whether you think about it or not, to an evening with friends and family, right? Yeah. So one of the things, and I mean, this is kind of a joke, but you, you could have retired, sold KB, and people were asking a little bit about the sale and all that and how, 
how how did that go down? Can you give a encapsulated version of, I mean, how you made that decision sure. to sell and what? Yeah, sure. Um, our investors came up to us, I think it was in 07, 08. And they said, hey, if we get to these numbers that the business will be, could be valued at X. I go, you're high, it's not gonna happen. Well, it did. And so we sold a private equity and good people, um, good guys, Bill Price, Pete Scott, um, and Walt Cleanse and a few others. And they were partners of ours for five years, but their goal is to sell things in five years. So we sold it again to a partner of mine that helped me start Cirque. He's another private equity guy, wonderful guy, John Childs. And, um, and it was another growth plan, right? To get to the another numbers to then sell it again, because that's what Pete, that's what they do. But it was always this drive to, to sell, even though we have to have the quality there and, and the wines and the customer service to back everything up. You can't just miss all that for a profit. You know, you just can't do it. Um, and then we, we did sell again to Duckhorn and, the, and it was a good value. And, um, and I think they're going to be, they are being a good steward to the brand. And it's like one of my kids, you know, a brand's one of my kids. Sure. Sure. I, I know Dan Costa feels the same way, but um, you know, we made a decision that we were going to move on. That's why I started Cirque. It takes so long to wind something up. And uh, I, I didn't want to get out of the wine business. And so that's why I started that brand. And then I can't stop myself with branding. That's why I started Chev. <laughs> but that's it for now. That's it for now. That's it. Well, no, I just, it's, you know, we could have retired, but there are people who, I don't know, I just couldn't see myself being done completely. I can't do it. You know, I couldn't go golfing all day or something all day, not work. And I love to work. I love to continue studying my craft because there's always challenges with it, which I really enjoy the challenges. And it, it keeps me my, my toes most of the time. And uh, I, I just couldn't envision myself not doing it. And also, ha I mentioned this earlier, Mother Nature, being having a tie-in with Mother Nature is so valuable, so important to me. And how else would I get that? I don't know. I'm not a good lemon farmer, for example. I don't know how to grow a lemon. But um, grapes are different. Yep. And to have that, I go, I, I, can't, I can't lose this. And so we bid farewell to Costa Brown. And uh, then we bought a winery, my wife and I and our family up here, the old Russian Hill Estate. Yeah, which is yeah. cool. That, that I was going to ask about that because you were kind enough to tour me around there and I want to come back again. I mean, it's been a year plus and all that, but what you've done there is pretty fascinating. There, the Russian Hill property, close to Sonoma Couture, right, right there. Right um, there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a cool property. They approached me about seven, eight years ago and I said, there's no way I've got to non-compete. All my money's tied up. They approached me again about um, two, three years later, and I go, I still can't do it, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to lay the groundwork. And I told them the deal, what, what, I, what I was up against. And they go, we'll wait. And they worked with us, um, Ed Gomez and Ellen. And Ellen. They um, were the previous owners, and I've known them forever. And uh, they worked with me, and they just wanted a, somebody that they liked to have this place. And so we wound up buying it, and we put it together. And... Uh, at that point, I didn't have a staff. I didn't have any vineyards lined up. I didn't have a winery. I didn't have liquid funds. Nothing. Nothing. Kind of how we started Cost Around. I had it, but it was out there and it was, I couldn't access it, right? But we made it happen. And now the property, we've got a winery on, on premise. We have 10 acres of Pinot Noir vines. We've got a big guest house. It'll be for our friends and family and, you know, maybe some VIP guests that are friends or whatever. Um, but we redid the entire house. It looks gorgeous, like a farmhouse and beautiful views over Russian River. And, and we're redoing the whole, that whole part of the property. And it's turned out really nice. So we're excited. I have no plans on selling this ever, ever. It's fine. You know, I don't need to sell it. Sure. I just want to have a place that we can make our wine and, and bring people up. We're by appointment only. And we're not really open by appointment only. But we'll take some every once in a while. But we'll do that more once we get opened up because we have a nice tasting room area. It's more going to be more like a lounge, not a proper tasting. It'll be proper, but not a traditional tasting room, uh, but really nice areas to hang out in. And, and uh, again, that vision of sitting around the fire and stuff like that. Right. Right. Uh, so um, the, 
one of the things that's interesting, so I just got the new spectator that's Pinot Noir, and it's not you on the cover, it's not me on the cover. So, but the reason I bring it up is when we started out um, with Pinot, you did, Siduri did, you know, Michael, Adam, Dan, whatever, all of us. I don't think Pinot had ever been on the cover, California Pinot, on the cover of Wine Spectator. I couldn't, I could not. Uh, have seen that it wasn't that big a thing there were certainly people that went before us you mentioned some of them there was Bert and Ed at William Selliam Gary Farrell people that had kind of opened that door then there was a whole generation before them I can't even imagine those people Joe Swan uh you know David Bruce uh people and Tom like Dallier Martin Ray uh the Zellerbacks yeah. at Hansel those people really came in with nothing. I mean, zero uh, guidance uh, along the way. Um, now, I, I mean, your role in, in our generation's role in making Pinot Noir um, open and available to people and the quality of Pinot from so many places, I don't think anybody would have imagined uh, that. I don't think so, yeah. and. And Dan and I decided we wanted to make Pinot, first of all, because we loved it. And we realized, well, it's growing right in our backyard here in Russian River. Right. right. And being sommeliers at the time, um, our customer base would come in. And my feeling was that um, the people that had a, a very evolved palate were going for these Pinots, but there weren't enough of them at that point. So we thought, well, I mean, we might be able to eventually get it to, get to 2,000 cases and sell that and make it decent living and enjoy what we do. You know, buy a little bungalow in Hillsburg, which nowadays is beyond, right? <laughs> yes. But, um, yes. and that's why we started doing that. And um, we thought we had an audience. We thought we had um, a business model. We formed after William Selling the direct consumer model, which took a while to get to. But um, we saw an opportunity. And I also, besides, I want to be a craftsman and being around agriculture. I've always wanted to have my own business. The American dream was very important to me. I don't, but since I was a kid, I saw this and I go, I want that. You know, there's an opportunity. And I read so many books and so many people's stories that they started with nothing and they failed and failed and failed and they kept at it. And then they became successful. It doesn't happen to everybody, but it does happen. And that was enough hope for me, enough glimmer of shine. And I said, I'm going for it. And I'm, I'm gonna give this 10 years hard time dedicated to, to learning how to make Pinot Noir and a business and wine. If, if I make it, cool. If I don't, well, I can always shake a cocktail for 60 grand a year. I got a backup plan. You know, I, I'm not going hungry. My family won't go hungry. Yep. Uh, but, um, and why not? What else do I gotta lose? I got a broken down Jetta and I've got a jar full of coins and a, a girlfriend that is now my wife and we have three beautiful children and a cool corgi. And I miss my dog, Jade, the German shepherd. She's buried out here. She's a sweetheart anyway, but we have a wonderful life. And, um, but it was hard. It was very, very difficult. As you know, you did the same thing, yeah. extremely difficult. And my spirit animal is the rhinoceros because when I had a nighttime job, a daytime job, a new business, it was too much for me to handle. And so I'd go home at night and I'd go, okay, how am I going to get through this? I, I can't quit any of it. I can't. I'm too committed to it, all of it. And so I'd envision myself in a rhinoceros suit, not a costume, like a real rhino. Because when you come up against an obstacle rhino as a rhino, you, get, you bust through it. You don't go around it. You just go right through that brick wall. <clears throat> I still use it to this day when I need it. And it's, it, it's helped me a lot because, again, the challenges of of the American dream and entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurs have a different way of thinking. And I know a few of them, which I love it. They're really cool people, but it's a different kind of way of looking at it. It's kind of all rests with you, if you own a business, and, um, which I don't have a problem with, but sometimes it'd be nice not to have that. Yeah. But, yeah. but the alternative, I would never take that in a million years, right? Well, you mentioned in the book, and it resonated with me, my dad worked for the state all his life. He could have made more money in private practice doing what he did, um, uh, but he chose to have a good retirement. He didn't take the chance. You mentioned in, in your book, talking to your dad, and he said, I could have been a millionaire, but I didn't want that lifestyle, or I didn't want all of that. That wasn't what 
he really wanted to take on. And, um, and it was less about the, the pure dollar amount, but just that entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit or whatever, people have that sometimes, or they don't, or they choose to take on that mantle or, or not. And I mean, it's fascinating to see, and you're right, there are occasional times, very few that you look at it and say, it would be nice to work for somebody else today because it's five o'clock in, in five minutes and you know the bell rings and I'm done. Then you go, oh, yeah. but that's probably not it for you tonight. I can't do it, Ned. No. I can't do it. But uh, God bless those people that, that do that. I mean, there's something for everybody out there. And um, wherever you find your peace and wherever you find stability, I think is a wonderful, beautiful thing. I just happen to find it in a slightly chaotic manner. So with right. kids, where do you think? I mean, I'm not sure any of mine are getting into the business, but I'm not sure they're not yet. They're not at a point that I know for certain. Uh, how old are yours? I mean, I don't want, unless you want to talk too much about it, but I mean, do you think they're going to get, uh, have any interest in the business? Do you see any of them? I'm not sure. You know, my son, Logan, he's 19 now. He interned for us and he's more of a scientist. So he's, he likes the lab and he likes the procedure, but he's still kind of figuring it out. Um, he's doing junior college right now, but if he wants to get into it, that's fine. And I told, I tell him that I told my daughters, I got one that's 18. She's moving into a Wahoo on Sunday for university, <laughs> but she wants to study marketing. I go, perfect. Well, Sylvie is our sales marketing gal is a total awesome sales and marketing person, tons of experience and a sweetheart, but super smart. And it's like, go work with her for a while if you want, and then take that somewhere else. My youngest one, she's 14, starting high school next week. So she's not even thinking about it, which she shouldn't, you know, she should think about other stuff, volleyball and things like that. But, uh, and, and my thing is uh, not to get too personal on our, how, our, how we think about it, but if they want to join a fam the family business, they got to get out there for a few years and do something else. Yeah. And then, then come back and go, okay, well, you're starting at the bottom, here's the drains. You know how to clean a drain? No? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Yep. And get yeah. at it. And I want to be able to eat off that thing. Because <laughs> yeah. you got to yeah. know it all, man. And you can't be afraid of it. I, I don't have to love cleaning toilets. I always love with interns getting them into the press after the first time you press something and they think they've cleaned it well and you start to fold back like some of the, 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 the places in the press and the, some of the bladder and all these skins start falling out. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's no clue there. We used to have this old channel press that had the channels in it. They're bolted yeah. in and grapes just stuck in there. And the same thing happened to me one time. And I, I went in there and I've taken the thing apart and put it back together many times. And I pulled this, you got to have the right Allen wrench. And you, I pulled this thing off. I go, look. And he looks around inside and sees all these channels. I go, here's your tool. I don't want to see one grape skin. No. And I'll check. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it takes, you know. It does. I've, done it. I, I've been inside of tanks with a toothbrush before. Yep. Cleaning. Yeah. You know, yep. the welds that weren't a good weld because you don't want bad stuff growing. No. Right. I always jokingly say the one thing I do know is that I've learned how to drive a forklift and yeah. that will keep me employed. You know, if the white business goes to shit, guess what? I can drive a forklift. I will find a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I can too. I like driving the forklift. When, when you get your right machine, and you learn it, and then you are one with the forklift. Oh yeah. You start doing your thing, you know? Yeah. It's pretty cool. So, um, like coming up, so if somebody gets on it, and I, I, I think you may have a waiting list right now and all that, but what if somebody signs up for the list, and I assume they can do that online and, and sign up and all of that, um, what would they expect that they would expect to hear from you and say, Hey, there's a waiting list. There's a little bit of time to get on. Uh, but they'll, yeah, so, you'll, you'll, they'll know what's up. Yeah. So, so the best way is to go to brownfamilywines.com. Mm -hmm. It kind of ties both Cirque and Chev together because Cirque has its own website. Chev has its own website. Explore them both. They're both pretty cool. We spent a lot of time on them. And, uh, and by the way, on the Sheb website, on the first page, there's an old guy. That's my dad. He's 83, still a craftsman. Next week, we're going to start with my rattlesnake uh, headband for my new Stetson. Because <laughs> I ride a horse every once in a while. But anyway, um, uh, where was I going with that? Um, 
They sign it. It. Oh yeah, so they can go to Brown Family Wines and then they'll go on both lists and then we'll communicate with them. Thanks for signing up, here's the deal. But here's the deal. So Cirque is about two to three years wait list right now. So we're not, we're not in a big growth plan on either brand. Chef, since it's a new brand, maybe a year. This fall, there's probably gonna be some room um, but this is our first kind of big offering, which is only like 3,000, 2,800 cases. So it's not massive, but it's bigger than last year. And we have some unknowns there, but the wines are being well received and uh, we've got a good list. So um, strength in numbers, so to speak. But yeah, they can go on and sign up. And if they have special requests, um, Leah Van Dyke is our lead customer service gal. She handles direct consumer business. And she's, she'll be glad to, to answer any questions. She picks up the phone, she's on email. We, we are, it's our mission to provide really good customer service as well. So we get back to people pretty darn quickly just to answer any questions. And then when we have uh, offerings come out, it's like, hey, this offering's coming out. You're still on the wait list, sorry, but hopefully next year. Or you're coming up, we have a wish list for you. We can't guarantee an allocation or you have a guaranteed allocation. So there's lots of different buckets that, that people get into based on um, how much time they've been on the list. And we're not trying to make wine so we sell out or we, we fulfill all the demand. We're trying to make wine that people enjoy. And if we grow too fast, we might lose our edge, you know? Yeah. So it is what it is. And um, again, we're in no hurry to grow. And um, thank goodness we have a lot of people that are very interested. Sir sold out for this year already, the 18. And that's nice, uh, but uh, you never—you got to be on your game all the time. But that's how people can do it. They can go to brownfamilywines.com. But I do suggest they check out the Cirque website, Cirque.com, and Chev, Chevwines.com. Um, and that's a pretty cool one. They've got to dive in and see what they both have their own flavors, you know? Sure. And, and then I guess last is we're kind of getting to the end here. It's funny, the last question I wrote down, but then it occurred to me, it's kind of a silly question, was simply, is there any of you that is nostalgic or kind of miss the old days where, you know, just early, early, early on, and there might be a little bit of that, but that's kind of what you have got going again now, where, I mean, it's very hands-on. It's what I've kind of got going again with Clarice and Beaumarchais. I mean, the world's changed a little bit, but you're there with the tank, you're there with the fittings, you are, I mean. Yeah, at some point, so and I love that. I, I, I call this our shop, yeah. but I, I do miss the, the earlier days of my winemaking because uh, I was in it knee deep, literally, you know? And now, um, even though my title's winemaker, Jeremiah Tim leads the winemaking team and we work really well together, so. I rarely clean a barrel anymore or that kind of stuff, but I'm very involved in the vineyards and picking decisions and fermentation strategies, which I really enjoy and blending and things like that. But, um, uh, but these days it is different, you know, um, when you run your own company, I got to make sure I'm on top of finance and marketing and the sales and vineyards and, you know, winemaking and staff and all these different things. And we only have seven full-time people, which are wonderful people. You can see them all on the Chev website, but um, uh, yeah, so I, I like them both, you know, but I've, I've had to pull myself back a bit to get a little more balance in my life because I was going a million miles an hour forever. They used to call me man on fire because I, there'd be somebody in the forklift taking their time. I go, get off that thing. We're running out of time. I'd jump on it and boom, they go, man on fire is here again. <laughs> so, but now I'm much more calm about things and I get out of people way you know resource them how, how best i can and then just get out of their way and, and watch the magic happen and it does it's, it's amazing um to get out of the way and watch people do their what they're good at you know it's really exciting to see people like i don't know the next generation makes it sound really really old michael but i don't want to do that but <laughs> people that are doing some exciting things um it, it, making wine i mean hopefully we still are too but see other people come around and doing incredible pinots and exciting pinots and trying and yeah. testing different things. It's fun. It'll keep going, you know? It's been going on for thousands of years. It'll keep going. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I got into this is because I looked around and in the wine industry, you saw people like Robert Mondavi and, and all these older guys that were still going. 
into their 70s and 80s, some of their 80s. Yeah. And they were still in it and they learn more every year, right? And I go, well, there's some longevity in that, which I like. I, I don't have to retire when I'm 40 because I'm I blew my knee out or something. It's like I, I can continue on doing what I'm doing. And so that's a neat thing, but but it will be really fun to watch some of these people come up. And you never know when somebody's going to just hit the nail on the head and then it's off the races for them. And I encourage that. And I love to see that. You know, I love to see people succeed. And um, again, it's very challenging. I try to talk people out of getting into this business. I'm going to try to do it on Saturday with the guy. I know, <laughs> but it's, he can do what he wants to do. Um, but it is a beautiful thing. You just got to realize it's not all, you know, the romantic part is cleaning the drains. Right. Well, what I loved it is that you differentiated on that. I mean, just to be, I, I don't think you're being completely fair to yourself when you say you try to talk people out. When somebody young says, I want to start out and work harvest and I want to do this and all that, you're like all in on that. When it's yeah. somebody who says, Oh, wouldn't it be fun now that I've retired from my day job to own 10 acres and a house and that would be neat and I could make wine off of that? Those are the people that are like, no you know enjoy you do the sailboat uh comment the sailboat analogy yeah the sailboat story is a good one it's a you know you know what a sailboat is it's a, something you dump money into and you know what a vineyard is it's something you dump sailboats into it's true you yeah. know you got to be prepared for that and i've seen too many people get into this game love loving wine loving making wine they design their label they make a bunch of wine all of a sudden they have four vintages stacked up and the passion has been Pulled out, pulled from them, because it's it's just it was ruined by this business experience they had, and so but some of them make it happen, and and I, I fully encourage that, you know, I don't encourage people to to lose their passion for wine, but I encourage people if they really want to go for it, well, give it a go. Well, I like that you know what are you now twenty one vintages twenty two. Well, 97 was the first one, so whatever that math is. 24, 25. This may be 25 yeah. coming up now, I think. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah. it's And you're still as excited and passionate and all that as you've ever been, Michael. So I, I appreciate you being here and uh, and really just sharing the whole story uh, with everybody. Well, I, I appreciate uh, you having me, Adam. And again, I looked up to you. I still do. And as long as far as a lot of other people, and I've learned a lot from a lot of other people. And, and when I was working in the restaurant, the wine makers and the growers would come in and there's a certain vibe. And I like that. I want to be a part of that group, you know, and a uh, different type of people do it. Yeah. And I yeah. like that. And um, so again, to watch you do what you're doing and, and uh, evolve and we're all evolving in our, in our own ways, but also in a very similar way, you know, yeah, uh, based on the macro sense of things. And um, it's, it is a beautiful thing. And, and I, I do feel fully energized. And there were times when I, it was really tough, as I mentioned earlier, really tough to get through certain aspects. But now it's like, man, I'm back at it. And it feels really, really good, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I can do things how I want to do them. And for better or for worse, right? Yeah. Oh, it is. So. Oh. Everybody, I'm going to um, ask you all to unmute. Thank Michael for being here. Um, oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Right on, Michael. Love it. Thank you, Thanks, you guys. Bye. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You, you guys are great. Seriously. Thank you. Yeah, again, thanks for everybody's thank time. You, Michael. Thank you for yours. All right, come and see us someday. Oh. Hey, Sylvie, come and say hi real quick. Where's this Sylvie? is Sylvie. Sylvie's our lead sales marketing gal. Oh, we love Sylvie. Yeah, yeah. In the background. Hi, Sylvie. Yeah. Hi. hi. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. There's We're here for you in many back. ways. All right, thanks, everybody. Shutting it down. Bye-bye. Thanks, Take Adam. Care. We'll see you.